uh, uh, Dr. Dilbag, if you do the share, you know, there's a share in there and then put yeah. the output on. Yeah, let's go and start then, yeah? Okay. Yeah, the most important person is, yeah, uh, uh, American can negotiate everybody because I'm, I'm, I'm totally idiotic in, in law and limb anyway, like you said, so. Do you want to click the slideshow? That's it, perfect. Let's go then. Okay, so Bismillah Rahman Rahim and uh, good morning to you all uh, because you are in the morning and we are in the afternoon now. <laughs> it's 2 p.m. here. Yes. So yes. Uh, I am Dr. Sia Dilba working as a uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon at Hebert Teaching Hospital Peshawar. The topic for discussion today on my behalf is the patellar instability and particularly the pathoanatomy of the condition. So first of all, I will start with the background of this important condition. Recurrent pedal of moral instability is a painful condition and often chronic condition following dislocation of the pedal from its position within the trochlear group. The condition has been estimated to affect about 5.8 per 100,000 individuals and more prevalent among females and the common age, with age group which is affected is 10 to 17 years. Once a single dislocation has occurred, then there is about seven times more chance for this patient to have the recurrence of the condition. Fetal dislocations are commonly associated with the damage to the articular cartilage, which can end up with the chronic knee pain and the fetal femoral arthritis, of course. Now, regarding the pathoanatomical anatomy of the condition, we must know what are the risk factors which lead to this condition. So for the descriptive purpose, we can divide them into the general factors and then anatomical specific factors. Among the general conditions, these are the ligament of laxity, history of previous patellar instability and dislocation, and a condition which is called miserable alignment syndrome. Basically, this is a combination of three underlying pathologies which can give rise to increased Q angle. And these are the femoral antiversion, genovalgum, and extender tibial torsion with the pronated flat feet. So all these collectively given the name of miserable alignment syndrome, which increase the Q angle. Uh, which is a factor for the lateral subluxation and dislocation for the patella. So coming to the uh, specified factors, and these are the anatomical factors basically. Further, I have divided them into the bony factor and the soft tissue factor. Among the bony factors, these are the patella alta. In other words, the high lying patella, and there is actually patella is not sitting in the trochlear groove with which lead to the lateral subluxation and dislocation of the patella. Another important condition is the trochlear dysplasia. Then there is excessive lateral circulation. And another bony condition is the hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle. With inability of the lateral femoral condyle to stop the dislocation of the patella laterally. Among the soft tissue structure, these are the dysplastic vastus medialis obliquus and then overpull of the lateral structures which are the iliotibial band and vastus lateralis. Last but not the least, I should have mentioned about the MPFL which I am going to discuss in further detail in coming slide but again that is soft tissue structure and one of the major constraint or rather restraint on the medial side to stop the dislocation of the petla laterally. Now we are going to discuss uh, the risk factors, I mean the conditions which lead to the patellar instability uh, one by one. Important of these are the ligamentous leg fitting. And uh, Beaton has devised a score which comprises of nine uh, points. One point is given for the uh, patio hyper extension of the finger. So one point on one hand, one point on the other hand, so comprising of two points. Then there is the patio abduction of each thumb toward the volar radial surface of the forearm. Again, one point on the right hand, one on the left hand. So collectively, finger and thumb make four points. Then hyperextension of each elbow. 
beyond 10 degree so two elbows two point so, so far making six point then hyper extension of e knee again given two point for both conditions the both sides so making it eight and one point is devoted for the ability of the patient to bend forward with with an extended knees and ability to touch the floor with the palm of the hand so all these make nine points any patient who is having a score five or more is labeled as ligamentous leg disease and ligamentous leg disease as we discussed earlier is one of the factor for the or risk factor for the patellar instability uh, on the patella we can check this with also the glide with the passive patellar glide test is a simple maneuver to evaluate for the patellar hypermobility now coming to the uh, genu vulgum another condition which make the patella prone for its subluxation dislocation laterally and the uh, determinant for it is q angle basically q angle as we can see from the photograph from the uh, i mean pictorial presentation on the side also that it is the basically angle which is made between the line drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine all the way down to the center of the patella and another line drawn from the tibial tubercle towards the center of the patella so angle which is formed between the these two lines is the q angle because of the wider female pelvis this angle is about 15 to 20 degrees in women while it is 10 to 15 degrees in men an abnormally large q angle imposes a risk for the lateral dislocation of the patella now another important structure which can be the reason for the recurrence of the condition is the insufficiency or rupture of the mpfl secondary to any trauma and just few words about the mpfl mpfl is a major soft tissue restraint to the lateral patellar translation when the knee is in the 0 to 30 degree of flexion so the first 30 degree of flexion i mean rather from flexion going to the 30 degree of flexion the major the strain is provided by the mpfl it's commonly injured gets injured with the patellar dislocation which again if not dealt properly then it leads to the recurrence of the condition uh, just a few facts about its anatomy which is important from the reconstruction point of view of this important structure are it arises from about 1 cm distal to the adductor tubercle and about 9 mm proximal and 13 mm posterior to the medial epicondyle and inserts about the upper two thirds of the medial border of the patella reconstruction or repair of the mpfl is indicated in the patient who have torn or incompetent mpfl which can be diagnosed on the history as well as examination augmented with mri and uh, those who have recurrent instability without evidence of bony male alignment those are the candidates where the mpfl reconstruction is basically indicated now already we mentioned about the condition patella alta so basically this is a high line patella and there are lot of ways to assess about this condition one of the simple way is the lateral view of the knee joint and the blue men start line basically which passes along the roof of the intercondylar notch should touch the inferior pole of the patella so if not touching then we can guess that this is a high line patella similarly um, in salt solvent solvity index is also described to assess the patella alta so basically it's a ratio between the length of the ligamentum patellae to the length of the patella itself and uh, 0 to 0.8 to 1.2 is considered normal while a ratio more than 1.2 is indicative of the patella alta another important bony condition is the trochlear dysplasia which makes the patient or person prone to the to suffer from the patellar dislocation is the trochlear dysplasia basically i mean normally trochlear is concave to accommodate the 
patella. But in this condition, either trochlea is straight or sometimes it is convex. To make just like a shape of dome. In these circumstances, trochlea is not shaped normally. And patella does not have the normal bony constraint to provide the stability. And again, it can be depicted on the later view. There is a sign for this, which is called the crossing sign. Crossing sign occurs when a line drawn along the roof, along the floor of the trochlear roof, which crosses the anterior surface of the femoral condyle. Other signs for trochlear displacement, which are described in literature, are trochlear depth less than four millimeter and an anterior trochlear bump greater than three millimeter. You can see on the side figure that there is a bump on the anterior surface. Trochlear dysplasia has been found in about 80% of the patients with recurrent tetrafemoral instability. Another clue in favor of the trochlear dysplasia is in the patient who has trochlear dysplasia, the trochlear sulcus angle is increased and some patients will have orthoplastic median trochlear facet. You can see from the uh, radiograph picture again that the sulcus angle is increased too much. And similarly, hypothesis of the medium femoral facet, which is again to cover the condition. Uh, another important uh, determinant for the uh, chronicity of the condition or the prevalence of the condition is the trochlear tubercle to trochlear group distance. It is a useful indicator for the male alignment, and there are a lot of uh, uh, ways for assessment. Based on the MRI or CT scan, but the important underlying philosophy is that by super, superimposing the two axial images of the tibial tubercle and the trochlear group, and measuring the medial lateral distance between and the deepest point of the trochlear group. So, this is the lateral aspect of the. Uh, All right. So, can I just stop you there again? Um, you said MRI scan. Yes. Um, it's actually been proven by a paper by Alex Arvold, that MRI gives you a false trochlear PTG distance. It's underestimated. Okay. So the standard of care to make decisions is actually CT-based PTG distance. And that's extremely important. So we must not base any decision to make uh, or intervene with uh, a tibial tubercle transfer based on an MRI assessment. It has to be a CT assessment. Thanks for your addition. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Dilbag, uh, just, just to add on, you've had your five minutes, you've got five more minutes, so we are sticking okay. to time, okay? No problem, sir. So TT, TT, I mean, TT, TT, this is more than 15 to 20 millimeters, generally considered abnormal. And uh, it has been associated so, with So again, coming back to CT scan, maybe CT scan of 10 and over could be abnormal. So in the presence of patella tilt and everything else as well. And it's important to know this, especially because you mentioned miserable malalignment syndrome. So seeing that you only have five minutes, I think the most important thing to discuss is miserable malalignment syndrome because not appreciating miserable malalignment syndrome could lead you to make surgical errors so that you treat other things and make the miserable malalignment and the patient worse. So perhaps it's a fantastic presentation and Mr. Shah can maybe uh, distribute it. Could you talk for five minutes on miserable malalignment syndrome? I'd be very grateful. Um. So yes, I think Mr. Hossain has got all those surgical managements. <laughs> so, yeah, so let, let Mr. Hossain do that. Let Dilbag finish his presentation and then we'll take it from there then, yeah? Sir, thank you. Okay, so just a few words about the pathology. So what is going to happen? Uh, first episode of traumatic dislocation leads to the tear of the capsule on the medial side of the patella. If it is not dealt with properly, they lead to the persistence of the laxity and it then lead to the chronicity of the condition, I mean recurrence, and damage to the contiguous surface of the patella and the condyle, end up with the flattening and then further dislocation. So, patient ends up in the vicious cycle, and uh, so it's not dealt with 
properly with the first event then can end up with the i mean chronicity of the condition so thank you so much i just uh, i'm thank finishing you. this uh, brief presentation that was a great presentation thank you very much so i think thank the you. key points to take away from that is that it's a very it's a multifactorial problem often with congenital uh, background uh, and there could be a, a anatomic and uh, susceptibility to patella instability. So, Fahad, it'd be an honor to listen to your thoughts on visible man alignment syndrome and the treatment of patella uh, femoral disorders. Jazakallah, um, Mr. Chris. I'd like to say, Mr. Shah, thank you for um, inviting me onto this forum. I, I feel very privileged to be here and, in fact, somewhat nervous to be talking in front of. Uh, Mr. Qureshi, who's actually taught me a lot uh, uh, of this stuff as well, actually. So, uh, uh, please, you. <laughs> please bear with me. So, uh, Dr. Dinsberg, if you can come out of your share uh, slides, and then uh, Mr. Hussain can share his slides in, yeah? Yeah, okay, I'm sir. struggling to share my slides. Stop share on your slides in. Yes, I will do it then, sir. No, but if you do it now, no, at the end, then nobody will stop. see Hussain's slides. Okay. So you just put stop share. <laughs> okay, sir. <laughs> I will do now. No, no, at the end, just go stop share. There's a green thing in the bottom of your computer, just go stop share. Okay. Uh, you know that when you click to share, just click that again and we'll stop it then. A stop share? Yeah. Okay. Now, now yeah, stop that's and you great. Your share then. You should have a green uh, folder at the bottom, which says share. Can everybody see my... Yes, 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 we're getting there. Um, okay. So I, I'm just going to uh, briefly talk to you guys about telephemoral instability, which I feel is a rather vast topic um, and rather difficult to really um, give you a straight, concise and algorithmic answer because actually there is no consensus on uh, anything that we do and largely everything's based on level three and level four evidence really. Um, but I'll try my best to, to uh, give you an overview of what I think is uh, to be done with telephone instability. Well, again, as uh, Mr. Dilberg said, um, the incidence is in the region of about six per 100,000, perhaps uh, six times higher in the adolescent age group and it happens more in females than it does in males. Um, what we do know is that recurrence rate is extremely high and can be anything up to about 40, uh, 44% um, after non-operative treatment. So going straight into the management of it, I won't talk about any of the other assessment or um, uh, the pathophysiology of it. Um, acute management, essentially the mainstay of this is in terms of non-operative uh, management. The role of operative management happens if there is any significant osteochondral uh, lesion. And typically this will happen affecting the medial facet or the lateral thermal condyle. Um, this is an example. Um, in fact, I was involved in a case like this last week where you had a big chunk of the medial facet coming on. There wasn't a lateral femoral condyle injury, I say, but uh, uh, in terms of an osteochondral fragment, but it was largely bone bruising. And in these circumstances, perhaps um, you would have to consider um, arthroscopic intervention to try and fix, uh, remove, um, or address the fragment, if you like. So, just say, uh, do you mind if I ask you questions or comments as you go along? Yeah. So this is a, a fantastic case, and I had one about three months ago. Mm -hmm. And what it was that the the lady was nineteen years old, and the fragment was lying inside the joint within the medial compartment. So actually, what we did, we opened the knee up and fixed the osteochondral back, the fragment back with darts. Yeah. And the subsequent MRI has shown that it's actually taken extremely well. So just because you, mean, because you mentioned arthroscopy and this is a big chunk, if the cartilage uh, fragment is large enough, do you consider fixing these back? Absolutely. Uh, and they can take, so the, the slight danger with arthroscopic uh, evaluation is that people might then get the surgical debrider and debride this uh, osteochondral fragments away. So be, I would say if you're going to go and have a look arthroscopically, if the fragment seems large enough, and it doesn't have to have much bone, it just needs to have a nice thickness of uh, uh, chondral surface, 
you can fix it back with some nice fixation uh, devices. I use the Intermed, the Intermed Dart. I don't know what you use, Fahad, but that was just a point that I wanted to raise there. So yeah, I, I agree. So, I'll make a comment, Fahad, also. Yes. In the good old days when I used to do uh, lower limb sports injuries, uh, I did try arthroscopically fixing darts. I, I was a poor man, so I only had the RCX darts. However, I could not do them arthroscopically, so I always ended up opening them because of strength. Yeah. And it was I, flexible for me to put it arthroscopically. Yeah, I, I absolutely 100% agree. I, I fix mine open as well. So you, I assess arthroscopically and fix open. Sufyan, you've got your hand raised up. Welcome. Sorry. Uh, everyone, nice to see you um, all. Uh, just to add and comment, just for the the third world uh, part of the world that we live. Uh, actually, I did patient in which she was a child of around uh, 13 years old, and we actually fixed the fragment back with headless. Interestingly, that also took us, and she is a now. Motion and the osteochondral defect actually healed, and that defect was actually and main cause of her patellar instability. So, just, just, just to add the modality of fixation that we have actually in this part of the world. To Fian, the darts actually cost less than the screw. I agree with you, Mr. Amir, but we don't have that available around here. So, you need to get it. It's cheaper yeah, we, than the screw. We are still on, uh, in, on our way, our journey is still long. Hopefully, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get you the darts. You can pay me commission. They're cheaper. They, they, they come, they, you just need a little introducer and they come in a little box like a suture. They're plastic and they, uh, it's very, very simple. Uh, even I can do it, so it's got to be simple. So, so, and so I, am, I, am, uh, I am not uh, uh, into money, as you know, Sufyan. Yeah. Uh, the Artex boss is coming to see me on Monday regarding the launch of the uh, uh, the nanoscope uh, here, and I will get you a few darts. Uh, promise when I see you yeah. next. Yeah, I'll, find can, I'll get you some darts as well. It's not uh, they're very cheap. So what they're, I actually they're, use they're less than a plate of biryani at your restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, carry on, Bahad. That's uh, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, they're totally fine. So I did exactly what you said there, Mr. Krishi. I arthroscopically assessed the patient, localized and stabilized the fragment in the lateral gutter with the needle, and then made a mini arthrotomy to fish out the fragment, prepare and fix it. Um, unfortunately, I, I used a combination of darts and a PLLA uh, biocompression screw. It's a, it's a, it comes in 2.7 or 3 millimeter screws, and it works really well to get compression on the fragment and then I used three uh, dots around it for rotational stability. Um, and once I did that, I, uh, you know, I was satisfied with the fixation that I had. He was three weeks old uh, by the time I got to here. Yeah. And actually, that osteochondral injury acts almost something analogous to a Hillsax lesion in the shoulder, where if you actually dislocate it, it will just lock and stay in that position. Um, so I agree, it's uh, entirely essential to fix these fragments. Um, anyway, moving on back to um, the mainstay of uh, acute management of uh, particular mobility. Um, it's basically non-operative measures. Um, one may consider a period of immobilization, and that has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence of instant um, in comparison to direct straightaway um, engagement with physiotherapy. As and when you do engage with physiotherapy, it's important to focus on the VMO strengthening exercises and not just- Fahad, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be naughty here. Yeah. How do you strengthen VMO in preference to the lateral muscles and the huge rectus that you've got? Because VMO is a small muscle. Sure. How do you strengthen VMO in isolation? Okay, so um, the, McConnell taping has actually, there is some literature evidence to support the idea that if you, if you actually meet, uh, tape uh, using the McConnell taping technique, it does help recruit VMO fibers more uh, preferentially uh, than the lateral or the intermediate fibers. Having said that, close chain kinetic exercise, and one of the exercises that I remember when I was uh, working as a fellow at UCH was uh, rowing. So internally rotating your foot, on the rowing machine actually helps you recruit VMO. I appreciate that you can't work with VMO completely in isolation, but what you're doing is you're preferentially trying to recruit more VMO fibers 
as you take these exercises. The key is so, those kinetic chain exercises. So the reason that, uh, that uh, rowing works is because if your hip flexion is less than 30, yeah. and you internally row, rotate. So that is where you favor it most. However, yeah. the conal taping is quite an old technique now. And all the, the well, actually, this is more physiotherapy research and their literature uh, mm -hmm. is that now you can't really strengthen, you can strengthen VMO preferentially, but because it's a smaller muscle and the rest of the muscles are much larger, even though you're not recruiting the larger muscles preferentially, you actually strengthen them more than you're strengthening the VMO because they're more muscle units to strengthen. So the closed kinetic chain is good for overall conditioning mm -hmm. and proprioception. And the McConnell taping, again, is good for proprioception and helping in alignment. But VMO strengthening uh, as a entity now within the group of elite physiotherapists um, is probably something that they think that it's, it's something that can't be done. So when you request VMO strengthening to a high class physio, they may uh, think your request um, is not quite um, as insightful. So, so check me, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm very basic now, isn't it? VMO is proprioception and it tells the brain grossly that whether you're sitting or standing and that's what gives you the give if it's not working. So what does it do in patella yeah. maltracture? The VMO is a vastus medius oblique. Yes. So it's part of the four quadriceps. I know you know yes. this, but it's a, it's the direction of line and its attachment is very much on the medial side. So the vastus lateralis, it's like I suppose in your hand world with your flexors and your extensors and the balance of muscles on the dorsum and the flex uh, flex sides of your hand. So it's a, we're probably going to use up too much time if we go into the specifics, but I'm happy to do it as long as you want to. But um, it's, it's the way that the sheets of four muscles is arranged within the, uh, within the quadriceps, which is a hugely powerful muscle, as you all know. So it's very, very hard to recruit just the, and the VMO, along with the MPFL, just helps keep the tracking of the patella uh, more towards the notch but the rest of the uh, and then it's more of a dynamic stabilizer but I'm sure Fahad's going to go into this further okay then no I agree it is it is a dynamic stabilizer and perhaps it is unrealistic to assume that you can uh, strengthen the VMO in isolation uh, but uh, the close kinetic chain exercise techniques and McConnell yes. perhaps a bit outdated what it tries to do is actually be a bit more efficient in recruiting more VMO fibers. But I appreciate you probably can't achieve uh, the level of VMO focused strengthening that you'd want using any of those physiotherapy techniques. Um, and perhaps that's the reason why recurrence rates are so much higher, or one of the reasons why recurrence rates are so much higher, in, in addition to all the morphology and the bony anatomy problems that coexist. Um, anyway, so this is just a quick. Um, algorithm that essentially summarizes what it was discussing really. Sorry, was there a question? No, no, just, just go on, keep going. Okay, so to the meat of the, uh, the topic really, recurrent instability. So what should we be doing when things fail? Well, this is where um, surgical intervention uh, is almost mandatory really in failure of non-operative management. There are multiple surgical options. You just have to check it in Google and probably over 50 different surgical procedures are uh, discussed and uh, talked about. And unfortunately, there is no level one or you know strong level one evidence or nor is there any sort of consensus. Uh, and the other reality of all this is that um, all re roads of surgery lead to pain and arthritis. Um, the study that I can show you below is a meta-analysis of over uh, seven or eight different uh, study, uh, studies um, and all of them show that there's a statistically significant increase in patellofemoral arthritis despite what you do for patellofemoral instability. Um, having said that, the history of uh, how surgical management has evolved, well, uh, in the beginning um, it was considered that it was a lateralizing force that was the main determinant of patellofemoral instability 
and uh, to correct that vector of force, we used to undertake a dead straight medializing um, tibial tubercle osteotomy. In the mid 90s, the French group, including the famous De Jour um, and his colleagues, came up uh, with at least four different um, parameters radiographically identified, which they felt were the main determinants of um, uh, patellofemoral instability. And uh, they advocated addressing each of these um, determinants, either individually or in combination, as what was required. Um, concurrently, at the same time, we did understand and identify that uh, perhaps the most important um, restraint or determinant of patellofemoral stability would be the idiopatellofemoral ligament and uh, that sort of took favor in terms of the prevailing um, surgical procedure in terms of uh, what we would offer our patients. Um, the problem uh, with just looking at those four parameters, well, one of the things is patella tilt. We don't really know if patella tilt is a causative factor or if it is a dependent factor as in a consequence of uh, the instability itself. Um, there is some literature to suggest that after an acute um, uh, injury, the hemoarthrosis may lead to um, patella tilt in addition to the ruptured or damaged or elongated MPFL. There is a study that shows a high correlation between external tibial torsion and patella tilt because the way the patella tendon has to also twist itself due to the torsional effects or perhaps what we all commonly believe the tight retinacular on the lateral side. The original the dual paper suggested that it was related to uh, vastus lateralis oblicus quadriceps dysplasia. Um, and would, they would advocate you doing a lengthening procedure uh, to correct the patella tilt. In any way, in 2015, this was revisited by Rob Steenson in America, and he did some wonderful cadaveric and computer modeling studies and uh, modified the anatomical determinants. And largely, you can divide them into two groups something where there is uh, decreased restraint in holding the patella femoral or patella uh, centrally or increased forces that are pushing your patella out. So trochlear dysplasia and patella alta are uh, fundamentally something that reduces the restraint in the patella central. Um, and in terms of reducing, sorry, increasing the forces, you can have rotational deformities which momentarily increase your Q angle and actually in the coronal plane and extension, the Q angle itself. The TTTG distance, although Q angle has multiple determinants, the TTTG distance can actually be considered a surrogate for an increased Q angle. Obviously, we must not forget the soft tissue restraints, both on the medial side and also on the lateral side, um, which actually confer patellofemoral stability. So, the first procedure, the procedure. Sorry, Pat, I just, uh, because we might not then get time, can I yeah. reinforce that point about the lateral restraint? Because if you have someone that's come to you who's had previous surgery and someone has done a lateral release, the problem could well be that they're now dislocating because they have a reduced lateral restraint and the patella can slip under. So I've had at least two patients where I've treated their patella instability by doing a tibial tuberosity tuber uh, transfer plus reinforcing their lateral structure. Yeah, lateral structure. that is extremely important. Itrogenic medial, uh, medial instability of the patella femoral uh, patella is extremely uh, recognized. It, it, it can slip laterally as well. So they, if yeah. they, someone's done a lateral release inappropriately, yeah. the patella can slip underneath the, the, the soft tissue and you can yeah. get ongoing lateral instability. So be very, very careful taking the history of those people who've had surgery before because you might have to do a lateral reinforcement before you, uh, along with your tibia tuberosity transfer. So then if people then release further tissue, then it can become completely unstable. So be, be very careful of, uh, and then say if you do, then do an MPFL reconstruction, when they've had a lateral release in particular. So if someone's had an inappropriate lateral release, you do an MPFL reconstruction, it's very easy to pull them too far medially, and then they will get pain and uh, quite accelerated degenerative medial uh, patella disease. Agreed. And that's caused by the fact that you've done an MPFL reconstruction with an unopposed lateral restraint, 
And that can cause significant further harm than if you just left them away and increase pain. So that's a trap that uh, is very easy to do. And if you develop a telephemoral instability practice, more and more people will come to you with medial sided pain after an MPFL reconstruction. And then you have to go through this whole assessment. Sorry, Pahad, I just thought we could spend some more time on that. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, so this anatomic factors model is perhaps a more updated version of the menu a la carte, as we all know. Um, and it actually forms a very useful framework in decision making, I think. Um, so we talk about what we normally do, the primary workhorse procedure, the MPFO reconstruction. Um, it seems to work in most cases, really. Um, and it's a very versatile, very resilient procedure. Chondromalacia patella or early chondrosis is a relative contraindication. There's many different ways to do it. There's many different graphs one can use. Um, hamstring, uh, semitendinosis, gracilis, allograft, you can take it from anywhere else. You can fix it across, you can drill transverse holes, vertical holes, you can fix it in the soft tissue. Um, they all are very similar in terms of uh, fixation strength um, and uh, efficacy. Perhaps what is important is where you attach it onto uh, the femur. Um, this is what we commonly know as Shottles point and in fact Focus and himself suggest to use both radiographs and direct visualization of the adductor tubercle and the uh, medial epicondyle to confirm and reconfirm your position. Um, it's important to use, the, you know, very much like your femoral tunnel in the ACL. Uh, this is a very crucial point. If you put it too too high, you will get tightness, inflection, and pain, um, patellofemoral pain, with the patient in prolonged periods of sitting and tight uh, tight uh, tight inflection. If you put it too distal. Um, the opposite may happen where you may get more pain in extension and it's too loose and unstable inflection. Um, so getting that point right is perhaps one of the key uh, components of this procedure. There are other, uh, other issues. You don't want to over tighten this thing. Uh, when you put it in, at most you want about two newtons of pressure. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that if you actually fix your femoral fixation in more than 60 degrees of knee flexion, then if you were to have any error in your point, your shuttle's point, then you may exacerbate that error. So the recommendation is to try and fix it in about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Um, but again, there is a difference of opinion and there is no consensus. Uh, a large retrospective study of about 192 patients where they looked at failures also suggested that having tunnels in the patella of more than 4.5 millimeters as an increased risk of fracture. Similarly, if you had full transverse tunnels as opposed to sockets, um, that can be a problem. And if you are to uh, try and do a bony fixation on the um, uh, on the patella, then one should consider using interference screws and suture anchors to avoid those stress rises. What certainly is very interesting, and recently there has been a um, interest in this, is of using synthetic uh, material for uh, MPFO reconstruction. And um, this that looked at 48 month outcomes of using fiber tape bony reconstruction procedures, um, and they are equivalent in terms of uh, Kujala scores and outcomes and absence of complicators compared to normal autograft techniques. Um, this does use uh, small bony anchors, they are 3.5 millimeters. And in fact, that case that we talked about uh, earlier on, I did, I used uh, this technique. Um, in fact, what I also came across is that you don't necessarily need to even use. Um, uh, uh, civil lock anchors at all, bony, bony fixation, you can fix it uh, onto the periosteum, uh, which is what Johan Bellman commonly does. Uh, uh, okay. how, how long was uh, the result for these? 48 uh, months, two years, just over yeah. two years. Okay, because when they, uh, there's the lead keel ligament as well, isn't there, that they, yeah. the, but the failures were more later than two years, weren't they? What do you, What's your... So I, I mean, the understanding is that that ligament is for probably more bioactive than uh, than the fiber tape, and fiber tape has been used in uh, many other uh, solutions fairly safely, is my understanding. But I agree, long-term data on the use of this fiber tape synthetic material per se is not currently available. But 48-month data is fairly reassuring. Uh, again, so just to just to kind of highlight the resilience of this procedure, 
Um, this is a study very, very much recently published looking at MPFL reconstruction in all walks of patellar femoral instability, be it trochlear dysplasia, be it patellar alta, um, or any other reason. And actually, they all do really, really well. And the only risk factors that increase the risk of um, a failure of uh, MPFL reconstruction is if you have a significantly high patellar alta with a cake foundation index of greater than 1.3 or if you have a very bond or clear preoperative positive J sign, um, which both probably are interrelating. Um, in fact, you know, you can actually do a MPFL reconstruction in isolation for patella alta because uh, there is some evidence to suggest that by just simply doing that in about 60% of cases, you can actually reduce the index itself and uh, normalize it. And in fact, um, I, I did notice that radiographically when I did my case, I wish I had the x-rays to show you. Uh, moving next on, tibial tuberosity realignment. I don't want to be rude, but you have about five more minutes to go. So we need five more minutes. Okay, I will try my best to speed through it. <laughs> so tibial tuberosity realignment is when um, we uh, we address uh, more severe severe forms of the problem where MPFL reconstructions have failed, particularly in terms of reducing the Q angle or distalizing the tibia to correct the patella alta. In fact, you can also use it in case of trochlear dysplasia. Um, we've evolved from just simply doing a MACA anteriorization procedure or a simply medializing procedure which, with the anteromedialization focuses osteotomy. Um, as Mr. Qureshi previously mentioned, a CT scan is perhaps more accurate in terms of measuring your TTTG offset distance. Um, however, the problem with simply using that system is that in trochlear dysplasia, where you can't actually see a trochlear groove, you may struggle to actually get an accurate measurement. Um, so some people have advocated the use of TTPCL. Unfortunately, that has to be used on an MRI scan. Um, even more so with different sizes of people, an, an absolute figure of 20 millimeters may not necessarily be appropriate. Although it does have the highest positive predictive value, it may well be that in smaller people, um, a smaller offset distance may uh, be critical uh, for the surgery. So actually people have advocated the use of ratios, which has a more individualized approach. Generally, there is no consensus, but um, people accept 1.2 uh, as the cutoff in terms of Kate Foundation's index for uh, distalization procedures. Um, the mainstay of this procedure essentially is to uh, undertake an oblique type osteotomy, which allows both anteriorization and medialization. And the degree of obliquity uh, will determine which which of one you want to uh, achieve most. And there are commercially available jigs, uh, namely the AMZ jig by Arthrex, uh, which allows you to do this fairly easily. Technical tips, um, you aim to correct to within 10 millimeters of... Uh, so at what angles do you suggest? For technical tip, what, what are your angles that you think? What's, what's the angle for A, B and C? Um, so the, the, the jig allows you to do 90, 45 and 60. Um, from what I can understand, uh, people recommend using a 60, uh, 60 degree angle because that allows you uh, an anteriorization of about 15 millimeters and medialization will be about 8.7 millimeters based on those numbers. But um, what you want to achieve is 8.7 roughly ballpark figure within um, one sorry, 10 to 15 millimeter TTTG offset, which you can achieve by doing that, and anteriorization of 15 millimeters to try and offload as well. But again, that's something you decide on your preoperative planning. Uh, we aim to correct, like we say, within uh, a TTTG distance of about 10 millimeters. What's important to understand is that your tibia fragment should not be too small, nor should it be too large. It should be quite thick for you to accommodate at least two screws, four millimeter, and if the screw fixation is tenuous, uh, then you may want to consider a slightly larger screw, six millimeter screws or 6.5. Um, one of the things I came across is to prevent migration, you know, one can actually use a span spanning plate across the distal osteotomy where actually you fix the most distal screw of the plate into the shaft, which is not osteotomized, to prevent it from migrating upwards. And, and you know, post-operative uh, protective weight bearing is essential here. Um, the results... <laughs> Do you plate on the, put the plate on the anterior surface, medial surface, or the lateral surface? Where do you put the plate? Uh, well, wherever the screws in the same plane of the screws, really, um, I, I, it'll okay. probably be um, on the on the lateral surface, really. Okay. Um, so, in terms of results, again, uh, the tibial tuberosity is a very powerful tool and can also be used 
in the context of uh, trochlear dysplasia uh, successfully uh, in combination with an MPFA reconstruction. Um, what one should be concerned about is risk of fractures, like I said before, too small a fragment, the tubercle fragment can break, too large a fragment, and then you create a stress riser in the tibial shaft itself. Uh, risk of non-union, sometimes people cut the most distal part of the tibial tuberosity fragment and then replace that fragment proximally uh, as a step cut, um, and that sometimes really increases the risk of non-union. Um, or and it's important to make sure you get good interfragmentary uh, compression. Like we said before, it might uh, worsen medial-sided pain, especially if you've already got medial chondrosis. And we have to accept that a lot of these patients come back with hardware problems, and they require subsequent surgery to have that removed. Trochleoplasty. So this is a slide probably where we've all seen this. Dujour's classification uh, is perhaps most useful in terms of determining what, uh, what kind of trochleoplasty we do. Uh, again, this is not something I've had very much experience with. I do have a case I'm doing with one of my senior colleagues on Tuesday. Um, but uh, the principles of uh, undertaking trochleoplasty are determined by essentially the George classification. Um, and despite popular belief, it is only two specific types of uh, de jour classified tro uh, trochlear dysplasia that we can address with a deepening trochleoplasty. Uh, some people will suggest that a type C uh, de jour defect can be addressed using an elevation trochleoplasty where you elevate uh, the medial side to create a, uh, create a more contained V-type groove, but that's fraught with poor results. Um, in terms of indications, the key thing is uh, not to look at the how flat or the sulcus angle, but the actual height of your supratrochlear spur. Uh, this operation essentially was designed to flatten that supratrochlear spur uh, and, uh, and try and create a, a stabilizing groove. Uh, the principles, again, of taking this off the Arthrex website essentially involves you creating an osteochondral flap um, over the anterior dysplastic uh, trochlear surface. Um, which you then recreate the groove in the subchondral bone. Um, in fact, this is a fairly powerful tool because it also allows you to lateralize the groove. And in effect, what you're doing is also you reduce the TT distance in that way. Multiple ways to fix it. One can use uh, smart nails. Um, but what seems to be very popular these days is the use of fiber tape or multiple um, fiber sutures to try and uh, fix the groove down there. This is an example that I got off the internet where uh, it shows that you start with a very dysplastic flattened trochlea with a spur, and then once you've fixed it down, you get a nice lateralized groove. Uh, the results, um, actually, uh, what it suggests is that this is a meta-analysis that I came across uh, uh, on my uh, research, that there is actually no difference between um, MPFL or any other surgery and trochleoplasty in terms of post-operative scores. Dislocation rates are largely similar. What's interesting, however, is that the effect size or the mean difference from pre to post operative is better in trochleoplasty. And perhaps one can assume that maybe the more severe cases are undergoing trochleoplasty. Um, and is there a benefit? There is no long term data about whether uh, it, uh, if there's a sequelae of OA, and the overall complication rates are fairly high. The learning curve is quite, uh, uh, quite steep, and uh, uh, it's a very specialist surgery. Um, the commonest problem by far is arthrofibrosis. We are also concerned about chondrolysis. Um, and you can have osteochondral flap fracture fragments, especially if there is brittle bone with pre-existing uh, OA. I've already mentioned the deepening trochleoplasty, where you're actually decompressing the space rather than elevating one of the sites to create a groove is much better. So coming back to uh, what we talked about earlier on, um, the concept of lateral release, um, I, I feel, is something that we should probably move away from and consider something called a lateral lengthening procedure. Um, lateral release, in my book, implies the fact that you've made a full thickness release of the lateral retinacular structures and you render that side unstable. A lateral lengthening procedure, however, uh, means that you increase the length, the excursion of the lateral structures, but you still keep it intact and in continuity because it is, like Mr. Croce says, a very important determinant of overall patellofemoral instability. Never, ever, ever do it in isolation. In in the context of telephonal instability. There is some literature to support its use in lateral compression, lateral tilt, and lateral chondropathy, but in the context of instability, it should never be done in isolation. Um, again, the indications that generally are talked about in literature is patella tilt of breadth in 20 degrees, but that can happen uh, as a function of tibial torsion or 
uh, or hemoarthrosis. So it's important to confirm clinically that there is uh, tightness uh, that can be addressed with a lateral lengthening procedure. Uh, again, it's important to continue and maintain that lateral strain to avoid iatrogenic middle instability or even um, persistent lateral instability. This is just an example of what a lateral lengthening procedure involves. Well, uh, it's an IT, you talk about layer one, layer two, and layer three, where the layer one is confident with the ITV, the layer two is the retinacular structures itself, and layer three, the synovium. What you're essentially doing is doing a sliding Z-type plasty between the layers one and two, uh, and lengthening the lateral retinacular structures um, rather than actually doing a full division through it, uh, which allows you to maintain a lateral chancrain. Other procedures which, uh, in the interest of time, and I, I feel something I can't address here, is um, osteotomies. In severe cases of uh, valgus alignment, when all other procedures have failed, greater than five times, you can consider uh, valgus osteotomies, commonly distal femoral osteotomy, but of course you look at all your coronal alignment angles. Um, rotational problems, like was mentioned before, knee torsion of 35 degrees, i.e. the difference in rotational angle between the distal femur and the proximal tibia rather than femoral antiversion in isolation or external tibial torsion isolation is what's key in making a decision to undertake a rotational osteotomy. Uh, I apologize for the rather busy slide, but uh, essentially this details all the different options um, or some of the different options that we can consider in recurrent patellar instability. But, you know, it, there are no thresholds here, and how do we decide what we're going to offer our patients? And so an evidence-based pragmatic approach is, uh, is this. Uh, basically, we need to understand that the patient has instability more so than pain. Generally speaking, if you're unstable within 30 degrees of flexion, you can consider an MPFO reconstruction. If the instability is beyond 30 degrees of flexion, then we need to go back, reassess the determinants, and have a plan of what we want to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I know I'm going to go, but can I ask a question? I'm very intrigued me about this sick patella syndrome. So can Amir, you, you would like to Mr. Hussain, tell us about the sick patella syndrome because we have a shoulder sick syndrome or a scapular sick syndrome, which is a physiotherapy term rather than a surgeon term. Well, if I had to address it in the miserable malalignment syndrome, because yeah, I yeah. think if someone has this excessive tibial torsion, then that's what drives pain because the force and the moments around the knee are extremely excessive. So then if you go and do things like tibial tuberosity transfer and an MPFL reconstruction, you can actually exacerbate that pain and then they become miserable. So that's why it's termed the miserable malalignment syndrome. So when you see... So that's what Mr. Fahad was saying, you know, when he was talking about torsions, that, that's where you need to correct the torsion rather than realign the patella. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the first thing you do. So uh, Fahad and I have uh, dealt with cases together where we've uh, changed the torsion and the knee pain is gone. And, these, and, and it's quite dramatic that as soon as you uh, change the torsion... So now, and this is where Sufyan's comment about the first world and the third world come. All my patients with a significant symptomatic patella instability, have a formal gait analysis, have a CT rotational profile. So I think this is one thing that maybe we can address. So the standard of my care, taking out the gait analysis, is that they have a full leg AP view, standing, patella facing forwards, pelvis level, to ensure that there's no valgus deformity. They will get a CT rotational profile, which looks at the leg length, and also a CT-based TTTG. And they will get an MRI scan of their knee to look for any internal derangement and look for the MPFL to see if there's signs of stretching uh, and to see if any condyle damage. So that's my standard of care. Now, I'm lucky I've got good contacts with a good gait lab. They'll go and have a gait assessment. If their tibial torsion, if their uh, uh, rotational profile is abnormal, so if their rotational profile is normal, I'll go and deal with local measures around the knee. If their rotational profile is abnormal, I'll send them for gait studies. They then tell me whether doing long bone correctional surgery will be of use or not. Because if the moments around the knee are not driven by the rotational abnormality, 
then you should not do the big long bone, more risk uh, surgery. If you have got to do the, the derotation surgery, be very careful of the common perineal nerve. I have caused one, well not caused, but the procedure has caused one perineal nerve uh, palsy. And especially if you go more than 20 to 25 degrees of correction, then it's at risk and you've got to consider decompressing a, the common perineal nerve. Again, as Vlad says, there's not much evidence. Uh, so when I've talked to the great and good of telephemoral surgery, some people uh, will routinely decompress the nerve, other people won't. I'll, I now use frames for her. Sorry, I'll let you finish. Asim has also raised a quite answer. He also wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hello, so Salam I want to say a very excellent presentation by Mr. Fahad Hussain. Uh, my theory and uh, my question, you can take it like that. Uh, we are dealing regularly with the patient with the knee instability. What my observation uh, is always that these are the females in their uh, teenage group between around uh, 15 to 17 years of age. And I, when, I, when I always check their, uh, they have a hyperlexity syndrome with the the diabetes for more than five at the same time when we do the mri and test that's where we find they have a trochlear dysplasia and according uh it's around uh, type c or type d uh, uh type of uh, trochlear dysplasia so that's where my more concern is if uh, well uh, as we have to approach systematically so in these type of patient what your basic approach is one the they have the this uh, uh, systemic hyperlexity if we're going to use the tendon the tendon uh, collagen is even the same is going to later cause again the laxity of uh, this uh, um, lateralization of the patella because our tendon we are using and of course we have to deal with the trochleoplasty and it has a very steep curve what are the alternate option or if there is another uh, protocol to deal this type of patient, uh, female in their teenage group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Qureshi, do you want me to take that on? Yeah, why did, why did you take it on and then I'll fill in? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I, I think um, f f first and foremost, we have to accept that in, these are very difficult patients to treat with. And uh, part of my process would be to have a long discussion with this patient, explain to them and tell them uh, how much of their expectation I can meet. By and large, all these patients will always have some pain. You're essentially going to try and resolve one problem and give them an increased risk of developing another problem. Um, but having said that, um, you know, we, we want to assess whether the uh, instability is at zero to 30 degrees or if it's beyond uh, 30 degrees. Um, if it is beyond 30 degrees, especially with trochlear dysplasia, you may have to consider doing a bony realignment procedure. Um, the de Jure's classification and a true lateral view is extremely useful here. So a type C um, uh, trochlear dysplasia doesn't necessarily bode well for a trochleoplasty procedure, according to the literature. I have very limited experience in this myself. But actually what has been suggested is a distalization procedure to try and get the patella to engage earlier um, uh, in w whatever remnant of a trochlear groove there is to try and mitigate some of that problem with the dysplasia in addition to an NPFL. Now, to answer your question about hypermobility, in fact, just recently in April 2019, there was a recent paper that suggested uh, that actually hypermobility does not affect the outcome of NPFL reconstruction uh, as compared to people without hypermobility. Um, but one of the theoretical advantages of using fiber tape may well be to mitigate any of the problems that may arise with stretching or re-rupture uh, in uh, patients with hypermobility. I think the type of patient that you describe is extremely complex, obviously. But trochleoplasty is full of dangers. What, because these are young females, the one thing you don't want to do is a huge amount of control loss. And there are two things that are philosophically that we can do to the knee. We can either change the knee to match the lifestyle or ask the patient to change their lifestyle to suit their knee. 
local merge, I think it's important to, to summarize this, it's important to exclude miserable malalignment. Because if you correct the malalignment, then they can eat, pick, and gone. It can go. And what you're actually doing, the reason that to do all of this in the younger uh, person is to try and avoid significant telephemoral symptoms in the 30s and 40s that will debilitate them in the prime of their life. So that's what you're trying to do and afford them instability so they can enjoy their current life. So what I would do is unless someone has gone and had fellowship and has become an expert on trochleoplasty, maybe do everything else and then not do the trochleoplasty and say, do patella taping, change your lifestyle, and uh, maybe that's the way forward. Trochleoplasty is fraught with dangers, and even those doing a lot of trochleoplasty will be very, very careful before offering the trochleoplasty. What do you think, Fahad? And, uh, I agree. So this is, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but actually okay. this is a paper that shows that TT, tibial typical osteotomy and MPFL w works in all walks of patellofemoral instability. In fact, they had a large proportion of patients with type C uh, dysplasia and there were no problems or the outcomes were uh, satisfactory. So and, it's not a procedure that you should take lightly. No, and for my own personal practice, as you say, there's very little level one evidence. I will correct any uh, rotational abnormality. After that, I will do a tibial tuberosity transfer and elevation. And after that, I'll do an MPFL. The reason I do, they do it that way is because if I put set the bony position where I want it to, then I can adjust the MPFL tightness accordingly. What I worry about is for those people where the MPFL has failed, how then if I move the tibia to rosti to tubercle over, then I'll affect the tension on the MPFL and I don't want to have to go and revise it. In terms yeah. of beta, beta score and lax, but that's not the common view. The common view is to do the MPFL uh, as uh, Fahad uh, says, and maybe this is something that I have to look at again and say. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of it is to do with lack of familiarity with the rotational osteotomy as well. And perhaps. Uh, and that, that may be because the MPFL is maybe an easier procedure that more people are comfortable doing. Uh, but then that's, the, you know, if you can up and treat 73% of patients, then why not do what you're comfortable doing? And uh, that, 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 that is a strong argument. The so, MPFL is a check rein. It is, it's, it, 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 it's not meant to be a really strong uh, dynamic stabilizer. So I think maybe that's why we get away with using a hamstring because it provides something biologic in an MPFL. I wouldn't use a hamstring in an ACL in a hypermobile or LS Danlos type patient. That, those are the tricky ones. So for my LS Danlos patients, I use allograft. Uh, but then again, I can. And uh, in that case, Fahad's uh, fiber tape. Uh, I, I'm really interested in that because maybe it will save me using allographs. So I will look for the long-term uh, effects on that. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. So, sorry, Kazim wants to ask a question and we need to wind this up because I have got to go somewhere else as, as Amir has. And I want uh, uh, Usain, you to stay for a minute. I want you to introduce you to Kazim and Sufyan after the talk. So, so can we ask what Kazim wants to ask and then we'll call it a day if that's okay with everybody? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Shah. There's a very, uh, uh, like a real time uh, problematic case that uh, I have seen and uh, well, I have totally been uh, uh, unable to solve that uh, issue. There, there was a girl or around 18 years of age. Uh, she is a, a college going girl and she had the same APLSCD syndrome and uh, recurrent patellar dislocation. So what was being done by someone else is medial plication with the lateral release. And now the whole of the patella is out of the sulcus on the medial uh, side of the patella. And uh, he has the, now the same uh, digital classification type C. So now what can be done now, like what else can be done to, to do good to this patient? Anyone can uh, guide us. 
So Fahad, do you want to start and then I'll go through things? I, I think, yeah. So I think my algorithm for this will be uh, largely the same. So uh, what is important to get a rotational profile on this patient, like Mr. Qureshi said, um, probably a CT rotational profile to assess tibial torsion, femoral antiversion, and the actual uh, tibial torsion would be uh, useful. Um, I guess if this patient's already had a tuberosity transfer and a complete lateral release, uh, the, the lateral constraining uh, structures are now missing. So one has to address that. One of the ways you can do that is by actually taking a small sleeve of the ITB and uh, reconstructing the lateral side that way. Um, another technique is to actually take your hamstring graft and actually feed it through the uh, quadriceps and you fix it um, on the medial epicondyle, sorry, on the medial shuttle spine and on the lateral epicondyle. So that, uh, that can press some stability uh, of the patellofemoral joint itself. But I suspect what, what's probably missed here is the rotational profile. If you've done everything else, one of the things that probably needs to be addressed or investigated is the rotational profile. Um, I, would, uh, I would agree. So we'll get exactly, do the CT rotational profile, the long leg uh, view. The other thing is you could take this patient to the ultrasonographer and see dynamically what the patella is doing under ultrasound. You could get dynamic MRIs as well. So now in my hospital, we can get dynamic patella studies uh, on MRI. But ultrasound, again, will give you some sort of clue as to what is happening. So um, you do sometimes have to just start again, but I would, as a minimum, get a CT rotational profile and a long leg view standing, patella facing forwards, pelvis level. Great. But there is also some value in uh, recreating that lateral constraint. Now you can do that with an allograft through the quads, or you can take a bit of ITB and uh, and cover that area so that now you've got a lateral lesion with the like it's almost like a rotational flap of itb um, Absolutely. and when you open up the lateral side you can actually have normally there's a sleeve of tissue that you can actually elevate up and uh, stitch so uh, it's it's uh, it's relatively uh, straightforward to to stitch it back up or use a bit of ITB, but normally there's a sleeve of tissue that you can reattach to the lateral, and that might actually be a huge thing to give stability because it just slides down. So if you just all search for the lateral patella instability uh, with the uh, following lateral release, you can see uh, diagrams how the patella just slips down. So uh, I think that's good. But it'd be good if you get those. Uh, profile and everything else uh, then we can discuss them maybe together again and then uh, take through. Pa, do you want to close your screen share if that's okay? Sure, sure. So, so thank you very much guys it's been a nightmare surrounded by low limb surgery and only isolated upper limb surgeon here but say that uh, can we agree to what we want to do next time? Should we continue with the theme of these? I think so. Okay. Can I thank Dr. Dilbag and Dr. Uh, Hussain for fantastic presentations. I've learned a lot from them both. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I've had Mr. Qureshi be to me. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to stop recording. Uh, what I want you to do is, I want you, Mr. Hussain, to stand. I want you to introduce you to Kazim and so that's okay with you, yeah? Absolutely.